October the 17th is International Day of Archaeology. I had no idea, being an archaeologist, that there was actually a day that recognizes what we do. I don't have any problem with that because one of the most popular subjects in modern culture is the field of archaeology. If you ever watched National Geographic Channel, Nature Channel, Discovery Channel, matter of fact, my most current excavation in Israel at Tel Beth Seda, I'll be showing you some pictures of that excavation. But I found out that in the field of archaeology, it is so new. It hasn't been around very long. As a matter of fact, I did my, my early undergrad, my bachelor's degree, my first master's degree, and I never studied the field of archaeology. It was actually at a church I was at several years later that sent my wife and I to Europe in the Middle East where we went to eight different countries that all had those things that have been revealed by the excavations of archaeology. I came back to the United States enthralled with the whole idea of archaeology. I began to study it. Matter of fact, I studied it so massively that I ended up resigning the church I was at, my wife resigning the school she taught at, and we moved to Dallas-Fort Worth area. And I ended up getting my master's in archaeology, my PhD in archaeology, but I really began doing archaeology. My first archaeology was in northwestern New Mexico, Chaco Canyon National Monument. And in that place, we found the most unbelievable ruins, Anastasi Indians, around 1200 AD. And I was thinking, wow, this is the oldest stuff I've ever seen, having no idea that I would go to a place where that would be a relatively new era. I'll give you an example of it. For instance, in the artifacts that I have here, this is a cup, handmade, okay? Not made on a wheel, but formed really in the same way that as a child, you would take clay and roll it into what we little kids used to call snakes. And then we'd wind it up to create some vessel. It was handmade. This is the Chalcolithic period. In Israel, the Chalcolithic period is about 3500 BC. Okay, so we're talking about over five millennia ago where these things were produced in Israel. I can tell you from that time period to other time periods, I have artifacts that are coming out of those time periods. For example, I was excavating a site in central Israel called Tel Batashi. Tel Batashi was a phenomenal site. I spent five years there. And then one day when we were walking into the site, I was in a cotton field out close to the site. And as I walked in the dirt trying to get over to the tail, my foot accidentally kicked up this bowl. Okay, I can tell you it is a bowl carved out of stone. It has what we call a ledge handle on this side. And the people I was working with at Hebrew University told me that is a Neolithic bowl. Now, if you want to go back and see how old Neolithic is, we're talking about six to 8,000 B.C., even before that. But that was, for me, an accidental find. I began to be enthralled in archaeology to try to find out these ancient sites. Now I've excavated five ancient sites in the country of Israel. We call them tales, T-E-L. T-E-L is actually an Arabic word. And T-E-L means a man-made ruin. It is a place that man settled down, usually for three reasons. One of three, but usually all three. One was the availability of water. He had to have it to survive. Two was the availability of land. He had to grow crops. And three, he had to defend the place that he had built. Whether it was fortress walls or high up on a hill, however he did it, those were three essentials. So as mankind built one cultural level on top of another over sometimes thousands of years, that became something that we call a tale, okay? Stratified settlements over a long period of time. I can look at these pots that are part of my collection, and I can tell you simply by looking at them, if I'm finding this in the strata of an excavation, 
The period that I'm in is the Roman period. I know the time period. Why? Because this cooking pot is the shape and design that was made in the Roman period. I have some pots, cooking pots, from the Bronze Ages. I have cooking pots from the Iron Age. Matter of fact, if you ever have time to come to St. Joseph Museums, you can go up to the second floor and there is a big display case that has things from my excavations over all of these years. I've excavated in Israel 25 years. I've taken different groups to excavate with me. And many of those artifacts are just upstairs on the second floor. And every one of them has an identifying card that tells you the age of it, if I know where it came from, it tells you, you know, the source, the site of it. So if you looked in that case, you might find, for instance, a Roman juglet. How do I know this is Roman versus, let's say, Greek or Hellenistic, Iron Age 1, Iron Age 2? I know it because of its shape. We know it that well, okay? Now, on, on the table in front of me, let me give you a couple of examples. This is a very identifiable juglet. It is so well known in the ancient world of the Mediterranean. It is made by the Greeks. Actually, the Greeks early in the late Bronze Age, the Minoans from the island of Crete primarily, produced this little juglet called a bilbil. We find it in Israel. We find it in Egypt. We find it in all the countries that circle and surround the Mediterranean. That's how well we know these things. I could also say from that time period, here is a little kind of beaker juglet. This is one that's very identifiable. This one actually has red <coughs> painted lines that are on the side of it. Okay, this is called a pyxis, P-Y-X-I-S. Okay, now a pyxis is one of those vessels that is from that time period. So if I'm excavating somewhere and I'm finding a pyxis or I'm finding a bilbil, I am in the late bronze level. Not just late bronze, but the Minoan culture at that period of time. That's how well we know ceramics and pottery. It is the main identifying tool that we use when we're talking about the level that we're digging in. I don't have to have the whole thing, okay? I love these that are intact, whole, complete, whatever the word is, but I may be in an excavation where the only thing I'm finding is this. Matter of fact, I have been in one where I found hundreds of these things. It is a storage jar, and it is a handle on that storage jar that would probably be about three feet tall. I have seven or eight of these in my collection, all the way back from the Middle Bronze Age, the time of Abraham, down to the Roman period. But if I'm excavating and find this handle, this broken handle, I know that I'm in a Roman strata. I could say the same thing here about oil lamps, Roman, Hellenistic or Greek, uh, Iron Age one, Iron Age two, late bronze, middle bronze, early bronze, early bronze like this. I know what time period I'm in. Now, that is why pottery and ceramics is so important to what we are doing as archaeologists. Archaeology is the one of the one of the most attractive fields of study in the entire world today. I mean, there's so many shows and books. There's so many magazines. Uh, if I wanted to, I could point out to you uh, a wealth of magazines. I take a lot of them because I want to keep up with the field of what's going on. This particular one is titled World Archaeology. And I will tell you that if you ever took world archaeology, in this case, on this particular one, you have King Tutankhamun. On this particular one, you have, again, part of the Tutankhamun mystery. And I know how magical King Tut is. I've been in his tomb probably 12 or 13 times. I've seen the gigantic uh, burial place. I've seen the mask that was on his head. So there are magazines that deal with this from so many different perspectives. For instance, National Geographic's uh, History Magazine. 
I personally think this is one of the most beautiful professional magazines that I have ever seen. I will tell you the American Institute of Archaeology publishes a volume simply called Archaeology. I have subscribed to it for years, and this is absolutely wonderful in terms of what it shows. There's an article in here about Pompeii and some of the photo, uh, not photographs, some of the murals that are on the walls intact in some of those places that literally shows us how they lived at that period of time. Smithsonian Magazine, I've taken for years, has a wealth of articles on the field of archaeology. So there is a ton of materials about archaeology. I've been excavating all of these years. Uh, I take groups now. Uh, next year I have a group or a trip that I'm advertising to Israel next May for 11 days. Next October 2021, I've got a group going for 12 days to Egypt. And in Egypt, we're going to go all the way from the Mediterranean Sea on the north all the way down uh, to the south, nearly to the border with Sudan. And we are going to see all of those unbelievable temples. Uh, we will see, for instance, the Valley of the Kings. We will go into the tomb of King Tut, King Tutankhamun, Ramesses VI, Ramesses II. Many of those pharaohs that have been remembered. We'll go to the Great Pyramid, the three pyramids at Giza, that's not the only ones we'll go to, but the, the, the history of that area is just so full that it's hard to really absorb all of those things. Now, these are artifacts from my excavations. The last place that I excavated in Israel was the site that is in the picture. Uh, I'm sorry, I, not that site. I'm going there. I'm actually starting at the first site that I ever excavated. This was a site called Tel Batashi. Tel Batashi was built in the Sorek River, uh, Sorek Valley. Uh, it actually is southwest of Jerusalem, going down to the Mediterranean Sea. And so you can see the square tail in this crook of the Sorek River probably built here because we found on the eastern side the narrow space here faces the river so the gates were there probably as an element of protection it was a it was a tell that we found excavated five years that started with the roman on top and then we went down through iron age one iron age two and then eventually into the late bronze age now for those of you that are interested this actually we have identified with a city in the period of the judges in the Old Testament. There was a guy in the Old Testament named Samson. Remember the story about him. The Bible tells us that Timnah was a Philistine city that when he wanted to get married, he sent his mom and dad down to the city, said, I've seen a woman there. I want you to get her for me. Philistine woman, very identifiable and I want you to get her for me. I'm going to marry her. We believe that we found the site that she actually lived in when she ended up with Samson. So we excavated there for five years. It was a hot spot in Israel when we started, evidenced by the fact that when we were excavating, we got up here early one morning, and there is a rocket launching military vehicle sitting on top of it. It's very common for Israeli soldiers and patrols to come in and settle on this for the night before they took off the next day. Very common for Israeli military, like this helicopter, to come by and, and uh, you know, out of curiosity, not out of concern, out of curiosity. What are you doing? What are you finding? Sometimes the commander of the unit would come up and talk to us and want to know what we were excavating. But the site that I excavated the last time is actually in the confines. Let me see what I have here. I can point it out to you. Actually within the confines of the country of Israel, north to south, Israel is a very small country. Even though that's the longest element, very narrow here from Jerusalem over to Tel Aviv, very narrow from the Sea of Galilee over to the harbor city of, of uh, Haifa. 
uh, the, the actual area of Israel is about the same size as uh, New Jersey, I believe. It's very, very small. And yet the number of millennia of history that took place here is absolutely phenomenal. And we have found these artifacts and other elements from all of those different time periods. Now, <clears throat> the Sea of Galilee is in northern Israel. We know the city of Capernaum, kind of the headquarters cities of Jesus, at least in the stories about him. We would stay here at the village of Gennesaret. Uh, there's actually a kibbutz there, Jewish farming community. Uh, it's called Genazar, or it's called Kinneret right now. But we would stay there during the summers when we were there. But we were excavating this city right here, Bethsaida. Now, Bethsaida is one of the cities that is out in the New Testament of the Bible. It's one of the cities of Jesus. Matter of fact, Bethsaida is the hometown of Simon Peter. I remember because of Peter's importance to the Catholic Church, there was one year at night, we actually put smudge pots, okay, of flames all the way around the outer perimeters of, of this city. And, and at night, in a helicopter, the Pope flew over where we were working just to see the outline of the city because of its importance to the Catholic faith. Simon Peter, it was his hometown, his brother Andrew, probably the hometown of James and John, fishermen. And I'll show you what we found related to that. Uh, we stayed at this kibbutz in living quarters like this. We would get up in the morning way before you could see the water like this. Uh, as a matter of fact, in this particular area of the kibbutz, you can see how full the lake is. Our digs were actually up in this area here, but you can see how full it is. There was one summer they had a drought. So instead of all that water, this is what you're looking at. The museum in the back, I'll tell you why they built the museum, was where our headquarters were. Our artifacts were stored there while we were gone in the off season of excavating. But in this area, there were two brothers that lived on that kibbutz. I got to know both of them. They'd come volunteer to dig with us. Really nice guys. But they're out walking around in that kind of muddy area. And all of a the sudden, they found a piece of wood sticking up that they recognize. It's just different. Hey, this is not normal branch or log or some chunk of wood here. It's shaped, okay? It's been worked on. And they were smart enough to call the Department of Antiquities in Israel. And archaeologists came in here. They began to excavate around the wood of that shape until here you can see that it's in the shape of a boat. And when they finished that, when they sprayed around it styrofoam, new technique, to preserve and hold together all of that wood, oops, sorry, then they lifted it Sorry, guys. Went the wrong way. They lifted it until they were able to preserve the entire boat. It was there close by that we excavated Tel Bethsaida, the hometown of Peter. Here I have Dr. Alderson, Tom Alderson here in the city. Went with me about four years ago, he and his wife Susan. And we're standing at a granite stone that is inscribed with all the schools that helped excavate this. And, and what I'm pointing at right here is Missouri Western State University. We actually are being known in Israel because of our involvement in archaeology. These two that you see, Will and Rachel Paulman, uh, they both work at Beringer Ingelheim, but they have been to four different countries with me. And when we were here at Bethsaida, which is now a big tourist site, has unbelievable numbers of people to come and see it. Uh, I got them to hold up the Missouri Western flag. The tell itself is very large. This is just a small portion. After we started excavating the different areas of it, this is a rope that is tied to a camera, okay? There is a balloon that we tied it to to raise up this high so we could get an above photo. Back in these days, uh, we didn't have little machines.
that drones that would fly up and take pictures, okay? In Israel, I'm not sure how often you can use them. But when we started excavating, Bethsaida was just this. Now, Sea of Galilee is over here. But as we began to peel back layers of civilization, we began to find walls, okay? I will tell you that in the topmost strata, we found a Roman city. Matter of fact, in the topmost strata, we found what we believe was the town that is where Jesus visited, the town of that time period. And as we began to lay out our different parameters of what was there below the Roman city, we began to find the Iron Age city. Now, I'm going to show you some pictures in just a minute where we, I can actually tell you now, this is the entrance to the Iron Age I city. 1200 BC. We believe that it was the king, it was the territory of Geshur, G-E-S-H-U-R. Uh, one of the daughters of the king of Geshur married King David, and we believe this is where she came from. So there is a stone pavement leading up. You turn and go in. On both sides, there are two guard rooms that guarded the gate from people coming in. I'll tell you later what we found in those guard rooms. We know the wealth of the city because of the items we found there. For instance, this is an incense shovel. Okay, it is made out of brass. It's not Bronze Age, it's Iron Age, but it's made out of brass. It's what they used to scoop up the ashes once they had made a sacrifice. We found a gold earring. No doubt a pierced ear on this end. The head is the head of an ibex, which was a mountain goat that is known in this area. So we found that. We found uh, Jewish coins. We found also like this, Greek coins. Okay, one of the main figures in Greek culture was the owl. And we found this, we found some of the Greek alphabet on the side. We found at Bethsaida nearly 4,000 coins, okay, from different periods of time. This is, simple, this is silver, a Greek silver. Uh, when you excavate, uh, in this portion of the world, when you're excavating, we were usually here all of the months of the June. Okay, so the high temperatures that time of the year here were usually about 110. Could even get it up to 115. Uh, we found various ways to deal with it. I'm not sure how much it helped, but we had to dig through those kind of conditions in order to find what we wanted to do. Now, you may ask, uh, why don't you go dig in the winter? Okay, why don't you go dig during the wet season in the spring? Because nearly all excavations in archaeology, and I'll point out every magazine I have here that has articles on archaeology, nearly every excavation depends on volunteers. When we went and spent four weeks, five weeks, sometimes six weeks on these excavations, we were depending on people coming and helping us. Many times the 25 groups I took, it'd be students from out at Missouri Western or, you know, other colleges and universities. I had one three years ago from the University of Virginia. I've had them from universities in California and Texas and all around. And that's when the volunteer labor is available. So we would dig in the summer, okay? Not sure what I'm missing here. Oh, there, there we go. Thank you. Sorry, I hit the wrong button, guys. I'm a professional that knows how to hit the wrong button. Not everybody can do that. When we started excavating, this is what we would find. Nothing but a tumble of stones. I, I mean, no design at all, except for the fact that we could walk across these ancient sites and find broken pieces of ceramics. A lot of times it wasn't a handle off a Roman storage jar. Sometimes it's a little edge, little bottom, little base. But there are thousands of them laying on the ground from all of these past cultures. Matter of fact, on an ancient tale, I can walk across it, 
make a collection of these broken pieces and tell you what time periods there are in the layers of that city. So we knew it was an ancient site. Now, unfortunately for us at Tel Bethsaida, it was in the area of Syria up until 1967. So nobody could approach it. Matter of fact, the Syrians put, land, uh, put landmines everywhere. Uh, the Israeli military came and cleaned them out around the tail. But there were fences that we just told our students, don't cross that fence. Okay, can't make any promises to you. When we tried to excavate, for instance, the Syrian army had built outpost guard towers. And you can see the crenellations in the stone through which they could fire over into the country of Israel, which was right there. So as we excavated, we had to deal with military weaponry. Uh, here on top of this underground Syrian bunker, you can see the fins okay, that are part of rockets that were shot, shot by the Israeli military into this ancient site because that's where the Syrian military was. So we had to deal with all kinds of disruption in what we were finding. Sometimes we had to clear all that out before we could go down into those ancient periods. This is a man here in St. Joseph, teaches at Central High School, Jay Oswald. Jay Oswald went to excavate with me uh, several years, and did other people here from all walks of life. But that's Jay, and I'll tell you that what they're beginning to clear, if you look up here, they have taken off all this topsoil, tumble stone. We found a lot of pottery in it, but they're really down to the top of the Iron Age wall. <clears throat> so all day long, this is what we're doing. We're not using big equipment. We don't come in here with, you know, some sort of backhoe or giant, giant industrial equipment. <coughs> Excuse me. Everything is by hand. So something is small. This is our main tool. Okay, it is called a patiche. Uh, it is a little kind of trowel that you can dig sharp with this in, a little larger area with this in. And all day long, we are taking out of here buckets of dirt. So you can see in this photo, this crew that I have working here, you can see the buckets that they are using. They also have a bucket in one of these, every one of these areas that has a tag on it. I want to know what's coming off the top of that wall. I want to know if you get over here and the wall stops on the right, what's coming out of that room that you're going into. That's the way that we date it. If any of you know uh, this doctor here in town, uh, he's a maxillofacial surgeon, Dr. Don Gossett. And Don Gossett and his wife and his son and daughter went to excavate with me one year. Uh, Don blamed us for the fact that every time we'd find a skeleton, we'd ask him to come dig it up because we knew that he knew the indenture, uh, you know, of the teeth so he could help us with that sort of thing. But as you go down through all of this, matter of fact, sometimes the walls that we would clean out, now realize probably two or three feet over the top of this is where we started. Now we're down this far inside of a wall on the floor of a guard room. And these gigantic stones out of which they built the wall was amazing. I had to use four different guys to get rid of them. If I had a wall stone that fell in this size, it took four men to roll it out and get it over the edge. The destruction is huge. The wall of the Iron Age period, we kind of did a reconstruction of how tall we felt like it was. And sometimes when you're going through these ancient layers, you can't believe it, sitting right there is a cooking pot. That is an Iron Age cooking pot. So we knew exactly the period of time that we're in. Now, it's broken, all right, and you can see that, but we got every one of the pieces, and what we do, we send it to a laboratory at the university we're working with, and what they do, they send it to a restoration lab. And in that restoration lab, there are people who glue it back together. I always have people ask me, what kind of glue do you use? Well, Elmer's, okay, or something like Elmer's. Why? Because if you don't get it lined up right, 
and, and the glue dries, you can put it in water and you can break the contact point and start over and glue it back together again. So that's the most common glue that we use. Now, at Bethsaida in the Roman period, we found a street. This is what the Israeli Department of Tourism has done at Bethsaida. They've got markers all over the place. We found places that people walked in the Roman period. We found streets like this. You can see the walls of homes and businesses on both sides of the street. You can see the opening here off the street going into different shops. One of the houses we found, we called the fisherman's house. And there's a reason for it. The fisherman's house actually had a big courtyard. It had a one level building on this side that mainly was for food preparation. It had a double level building, two story on the other side, that was the residences. Why did we call it the fisherman's house? Because in this courtyard and in these rooms, we found fish hooks. We found lead weights like you used to fish with. We even found stone weights they would use in a boat like an anchor. And we had these on display. This is a stone shaped flat on the bottom. You see the hole carved to the top all the way. The fisherman would tie a rope through this, have it on the boat, toss it over the side, and that became the way they anchored their boat. We did find one piece of jar handle that had an iron anchor that was carved into the side of it. Another evidence of fishing. We found one house we call the wine grower's house. Why? Because in the courtyard of that particular home, we found, and I'll show you, this is a courtyard of it, we found a wine cellar. All right? It was covered with stones on the top and on the sides. It had steps going down into it. And when we got down into it, what we found was wine storage jars. None of these had wine in them, but we have found them, by the way, sealed, that still had wine in them. So this is a wine storage jar. All of these, by the way, are from the Roman period. We found Roman jars, we found Roman lamps, Roman platters, Roman bowls, everything that related, and Roman coins, everything that related to that period of time. In the Iron Age, we found unlike the Roman period, Roman period has no fortifications. In the Roman period, they weren't afraid of anything. The Romans were in control. The Roman soldiers were looking out over the city and everything going on. They weren't worried about invaders. Iron Age, very different. In the Iron Age, we believe the Iron Age I city was destroyed by the Assyrians. We see evidences of their assault of the city and the destruction they did. So in the Iron Age, we find pavement leading into the city. Right here is the threshold of the gate. The gate would be wooden gates inside that would close inwardly like this up against these stones where they would stop. And then the gate would be locked. As you go in the Iron Age gate, you have four guard chambers, two on either side, and then eventually you'd break in to the center of the Iron Age gate. I'm sorry, the Iron Age city. So in a larger plan, the black that you see is actually Roman. Underneath it, the blue that you see is the Iron Age wall going all the way around. The red that you see is the guard rooms of the Iron Age period of time. This is an artist rendering of what that gate looked like. Uh, when you would come up the paved road, go inside the gate, you actually had to make a 90 degree turn to the left. And you had to make it with guards on top of all of those towers looking directly down on where you were. It was a magnificent fortification system. So in this picture, I'm looking at the Iron Age gate entrance. Uh, this is the pavement. We found the pavement went to the right way down the hill. Before you ever got to the gate opening, the guard towers would be on all the sides. But the unique thing we found, if you see these two stones, these are called in Iron Age culture, Matsiboth. And Matsiboth 
was, a, was actually something that was built in honor of the God of the city. Who was the God of the city? How do we know? Well, I'm going to show you how we know, exactly how we know. We found eight of the Matsi bows scattered all the way through the city. But when we excavated going into the town through the Iron Age gate here, we found a structure right here on the right, right below what would have been the guard tower. It was unique because this was the stone Matsi both or Stila. What we looked at was this right here. And I'll show you in a close-up. You can see three steps leading up to the top. It was actually an altar to honor the God of the city. And the practice was that when you went into the city, you would step up to that basin and you would offer the God a sacrifice. In this case, we think it was an incense sacrifice. In this case, where they stepped up three steps to the top, this was the basalt stone basin where their sacrifices would have been made. Now, who were they sacrificing to? I will tell you that right behind this was a large carved stone that fell forward in the Assyrian assault, was broken into three pieces, and we cleaned all this out. We took up all three pieces, had no idea until we put it together who we were talking about until we put it all back together. I'm standing here beside a replica of that stone. The actual stone is in the Israel National Museum in Jerusalem, the only one that has ever been found. And you can see carved into that stone, which we couldn't see till we picked it up. You can see a God in the Old Testament that is referred to as the God of Baal. B-A-A-L. Okay? Nothing's ever been found like that before. Baal was the god of war. He was the god of the moon. So you see the moon between his rounded horns on his head. You also see that he is pictured bull head, but the body of a man. Two arms, two legs, and across his waist, a sword to indicate his authority and his power. This is actually what is pictured there. So we know in the Iron Age period who the god of the city was. What are these? Not regular ceramics. These are incense bowls. We actually found them right there in that basin in front of where the bell statue stood. They are incense bowls that have holes that are punched all the way around so that as you brought a sacrifice to that god Baal, they would burn incense and the incense would not only go up, it would go out to the sides out of those bowls. That was one of the practices of ancient religion in that day. We just happened to find the exact things. When we're excavating, we don't want to miss a thing. Sometimes it is something as small as the tiniest little bead that was part of a necklace. Uh, we find amazing things in the screening process. Every bucket of dirt we turn up, we, we send it through the screens. We have found a wealth of treasures when we're doing that. And I will tell you my work as an archeologist and a supervisor is to record everything we find. I have a case. In that case, you can see the patiche. I've got pens, I've got markers, I've got pieces of paper, I'm drawing a master plan of the area we're excavating. I'm listing here all of what we have found in every different locale within the confines of that area, down to the last piece of pottery. We never throw anything away. Bones here, pottery here. I can take these bones and tell you exactly what the people were eating, what animal, how many of them. We're that precise in what we pull up. A lot of the pottery is broken. It's put back together. Again, back to the work of the restoration lab. These are all vessels that have been found at Bethsaida that have been put back together. This one is significant because it is a Cypriot storage jar. That means 
that it came from the island of Cyprus. And that indicates to us there was a trade network that was going on between whoever lived here in Israel's time and, and, the, and the islands in the Mediterranean. They were having interaction and commerce with the islands. Archaeology is not a magical thing, okay? Uh, Archaeology uncovers things that I got to admit to you seem magical to me. Uh, matter of fact, they seem so magical in the beginning that there was a writer called Von Donegan. And if you want to go look up his book, Von Donegan wrote a book called Chariots of the Gods. And in that book, Von Donegan said that all of the pyramids, these massive structures, these things we can't explain, they were all done by outer space people that came and visited this world. The Easter Island statues, the three pyramids at Giza, all these different things. He had this fairy tale idea. A lot of people fall for it. But we think we can explain pretty precisely how people constructed these cities, whether it's a gigantic pyramid, the Great Pyramid of Cheops in, at Giza in Israel, I'm sorry, in Egypt, or something as basic as Tel Bethsaida. We believe that we have identified what the elements are for. And I'll end with this one item. On the table, I have a variety of things, certainly ceramics. One is a knife blade. Is it an ancient Iron Age knife blade from the Iron Age? I found this accidentally. Uh, I was in northern Israel at a site called Tel Dan, D-A-N, one of the most famous cities in, in the biblical stories. And I kicked it up walking around and, and, and got it and brought it with me. On our digs, for instance, we have found hundreds of, of these little round items here with a hole in the center. Matter of fact, I jokingly say to people, this is where I think the Jews got their idea for a bagel. I mean, if you go to a Jewish deli, everybody's got, de everybody's got bagels, okay? It's not. It's a chunk of clay. The only reason I have them is because where I found them in piles of 100, they were burned and baked in a fire just like the clay on a jar. And that's how I was able to recover them. What were they? We believe that they were loom weights. That when somebody was looming and weaving and making fabric back in those days, that as the strings were tied at the top, they come down the loom, they go over the edge, that those strings at the bottom were tied then through these. It gave enough tightness that as the weaver was going back and forth on the shuttle, they could go up and over and above all the strings, and this would keep it still tight enough that the fabric would be made. So it's just loom weights. I can show you a wealth of these things that we have found. The marvel of archaeology is not just that we find items people use in their everyday life, like pottery. It's not just something as simple as a loom weight and what it was used for. For me, it is, and I hate to use the word magic, uh, for me, it is the mind-blowing element that I can step back in time 3,000 years and find how people lived, who they were, what they believed, and, and, and understand this, archaeology is the scientific study of the material remains of the human past. It doesn't deal with theology, doesn't deal with philosophy, doesn't deal with what their belief system was in those days. The material remains of ancient man. And then trying to take those material remains and figure out what does it tell us about those people. The International Day of Archaeology is just simply a notation and a focus that says we need to recognize the tremendous value of the scholarly discipline and the thousands that are working on it every day. Thank you for joining me, sharing this with me, 
and just listening to the things that I wanted to share with you about what's it like being an archaeologist.